Okay, thank you very much for inviting me here. So I'm gonna talk about a, to a topic that's actually very timely because we're at a point right now where some of the laws re regarding surveillance are about to be and coming up for renewal. So December 2017, um, the FISA Amendment Act needs to be re renewed. And so, um, you know, the issue of surveillance nationally has gone a little bit quiet recently. Uh, disappointingly for me, actually, given that the sunset is so soon, this December 2017 date is very, very imminent. Um, but I think this is a really important issue, and I, I hope more people will pay attention to it because there's really like an opportunity coming up to do something about it. Okay, so let me tell you what I want to spend some time on today. Um, I'm a computer scientist. Um, this is a paper that I wrote for the Century Foundation um, as a policy article talking about surveillance law and how um, the surveillance law that we have today was formed um, at a different time uh, in the 70, late 70s, early 80s. And we're still using laws that were built within this framework of the basically early 80s. And as we all know, you know, the world has changed a lot since the early 80s, and in particular the internet, and a lot of surveillance is, co is conducted over the internet. So we're guided by these laws that are very old. Um, and so if you look at the laws as a computer scientist, you start to see, wow, there's a lot of ways where the laws are really not capturing potentially what was intended when they were framed. And so what this talk is about is about a look at uh, the US surveillance law framework, what is authorized by law, and how these laws are structured in a way that could actually be circumvented by using the technology of the internet. So the internet we have today, um, which is not what they were thinking of back in 1978 and 1981 where these laws were set up. So um, I'm gonna start off by just giving us a high level view of the two legal um, authorities that are relevant to the conversation we're gonna have today. Um, the first one is called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. So um, this was a statute passed by Congress in 1978. Um, it, it's very, very detailed, very complicated what it authorizes, but I need to simplify things for the purpose of this talk. I clearly cannot explain all of FISA in this one hour um, and also tell you about how technology can be used to circumvent some of it. Um, so I'm just gonna really simplify things and say that FISA is basically um, legislative authorization for surveillance conducted on US soil. So if you're surveilling using data that you collected on US soil, that would fall under FISA for the most part. And what's really cool about FISA, so if you've, how many people have heard about FISA? Okay, how many people have heard anything positive about FISA from the perspective of protecting people's privacy? Okay, so actually I think that FISA actually has a bit of a bad rap in a lot of ways because we hear a lot of bad about FISA, about how FISA is not sufficiently protective and I agree with a lot of that, but I also want to point out that FISA surveillance is overseen by the FISA court and I know that we've all heard a lot of things about the FISA court, but the FISA court is an actual court. It's under the judicial branch. Um, it is staffed by federal district judges that are appointed by the Chief Justice of the US. So the judicial branch is appointing the judges in the FISA court. These are not um, NSA lawyers, right? These are not intelligence community and, and executive branch um, lawyers that are making these decisions. These are judges. And so these judges, maybe they're inclined to authorize surveillance, but their role is not to authorize surveillance. Their role is to be judges, right? And so there is judicial oversight for programs conducted under FISA. And if you look back to the 70s when this was passed, and it took a long time to pass this, um, the discussion was we need to have judicial oversight for surveillance and that's why FISA was put in place at this time. Um, now there's another authority that's really important called Executive Order 12333. How many people have heard of this? Okay. So this is really interesting because um, this has been not very much in the media. If you're a geek about this stuff like I am, then 12333 is like this looming thing, um, but the, you know, most people haven't really thought about it or heard about it. So Executive Order 12333 is an executive order signed by Reagan in 1981. Um, and so because of the way things are structured, the president has sole authority for surveillance conducted abroad, as long as that surveillance does not intentionally target a US person. That's the distinction between what falls under FISA and what falls under 12333. Okay, so there's two important points here if the surveillance is conducted abroad. So that means, for example, if the data was collected on a cable that is located in a foreign country. So let's say it's collected from a, a, an optical fiber that's in the UK. 
then it would be under Executive Order 12333 as long as the surveillance does not intentionally target a U.S. person. Okay, so just remember that. You might be wondering what intentionally target a U.S. person actually means. Um, I just want to mention something that this language, intentionally target a U.S. person, comes from FISA in 1978. So that legal term was established in 1978 as part of FISA. And it's very, very unclear what it actually means. And so that's where a lot of the issues come in when we think about privacy. Um, what does it mean to actually intentionally target a U.S. person? So I'm going to spend a little, a, like, a bit of energy on what that actually means. But as long as these two things are the case, if it's conducted abroad and it's not intentionally targeted a U.S. person, it doesn't fall under FISA, it falls under 12333. And so what that means is that you no longer have the court oversight that you would have if you were, um, if you were under FISA. So you don't have to have the programs authorized by the FISA court. So there's no judicial uh, oversight. Um, and interestingly, the NSA has itself stated publicly, and this is not even in leaked documents if I remember correctly, that the majority of its SIGINT activities are solely pursuant to the authority provided by 12333. So this is very, very important for the surveillance that's done um, by the U.S. intelligence community. Um, that's well known. And so since a lot of surveillance is happening under here, it's interesting to think about, you know, what is this actually authorizing? Um, to I can talk a lot about like, what are the differences between surveillance under FISA and surveillance under 12333, but the really high level point I want to make is that uh, 12333 is more permissive, so you can do more kinds of surveillance with less oversight in general than you could under FISA. And there are examples of this that I can go into, and I, I try not to spend too much time on them, but if you want to know specific examples, I'm happy to go through some of the examples that I have about why FISA is less... Um, uh, FISA is more protective than Executive Order 12333. Um, so if you are a technical person, you say to yourself, wait a minute, and this is what I said to myself the very first time I heard about this in 2014 was, wait a minute, why is there a distinction between traffic that I collect from a fiber that's located in the US and traffic that I collect from a fiber that's located in the UK? Why is there a difference, right? Because the internet is global. Um, it's not the case that all American traffic stays in the U.S. We haven't designed the Internet to respect national borders for the most part, although there's been moves in that direction. That's not how it was designed. We know that traffic crosses borders. So why is the law so careful about where we collect traffic? It turns out that it is very careful about that, and the reason I think you can see is from the dates, right? So if you think about it, at the time where these things were drafted, this made a lot of sense because we had the telephone system, we had different technology that wasn't as global as what we have today. So think back to before the Internet. And so what this really creates is a situation in which um, by trying to collect the traffic abroad, you don't have to fall under the oversight of FISA, and you can do more types of surveillance less, with, with less oversight. And this is the loophole that I want to talk about today. Um, so I guess there's no, I'm not going to take any questions in the talk, but this is, this is the framework, right? We're trying to think about under what conditions can surveillance um, be conducted abroad that would be more permissive than surveillance conducted on U.S. soil. Okay, so my first point is that U.S. traffic can naturally, um, naturally flow abroad. Um, I'm going to give an example of that actually happening. This is a well-known example. Um, but what's really interesting, um, if, if you come with, from my background, my background is in routing, networking, you know, how do you manipulate network protocols. The first thing that I thought of when I saw this was, wait a minute, even if U.S. person's traffic is staying naturally in the U.S., which it may not, but let's say it is, I can actually do all kinds of fun routing attacks and different kinds of network manipulations to force that traffic out of the U.S., Okay, so what I want to do in the second part of this talk is talk about how we can force traffic from the U.S. abroad by deliberately ma manipulating routing protocols. And um, there is a now evidence um, in the last, you know, two or three years that has come out, not immediately at the beginning of the Snowden revelations, but more towards the end. There's been evidence that the NSA has the capability to reroute traffic. Um, we have no evidence that, that the NSA is using this to circumvent FISA in order to spy on Americans abroad. We have no evidence of that, but we do have evidence that, that the NSA has the ability to reroute traffic, which is not surprising if you think about it as a security person. I would expect them to have this capability. So the question that I want to uh, look at is, would it be legal to actually do this? To take traffic from the U.S., use network protocol manipulations to force it abroad, and then um, surveil it using Executive Order 12333, which is more permissive. 
Okay, so that's the second thing I'm gonna talk about, and then I'm gonna just conclude by talking about some ways that um, the laws could be updated to be more in line with having FISA protect surveillance of Americans and having 12333 really govern the surveillance of foreigners, which is how this was initially set up when it was drafted in the 70s and 80s. Okay, does it make sense? So we really, we really want FISA to protect Americans. We don't wanna be able to circumvent FISA by doing funny things with the network and then spying on the traffic abroad under 12333, which is really supposed to govern the surveillance of foreigners. That's why these things were set up that way. Okay. All right, so um, how many people have seen this from the Snowden revelations 2013? Okay, this was one of the most shocking revelations in my opinion. Um, so this is, a, this is a slide that was leaked, and um, what it's showing is that there is um, the Google network here, and these are Google data centers. And here you have a Google front end that was providing encryption for Google users. So this is SSL encryption for Google users. Should be TLS, but it says SSL. And um, here you see the data centers. Now what's interesting here is that the, at the time when this was made, the data centers were not encrypting the traffic that were being sent between the two data centers. And so this was all this clear text traffic that was relevant data about uh, Google users. So you can imagine all the kinds of things you could find in there. Um, and so what was being done was that there was surveillance conducted on the traffic between the data centers. And if you read this article in the Washington Post, what it talks about is full take or bulk surveillance conducted under 12333. Okay, why was it conducted under 12333? Because the surveillance was conducted abroad because the fiber that was actually tapped was not a fiber that was in the US, but it was a fiber that was probably in the UK, from what we can tell. Okay, so because it was tapped abroad, it fell under 12333, and all of the protections of FISA were actually missing. So all the judicial review that you would have had if you would do something under FISA would have been there. Um, and so at this point, you should ask yourself, wait a minute, isn't this intentionally targeting a US person? Right, so we talked about what goes under FISA and what goes under 12333. Under FISA, under 12333, it's, it's only if it's conducted abroad and not intentionally targeting a US person. How could this be done under 12333? It looks like a lot of US persons use Google, so how could you do this? Right? And that's another issue that I wanted to highlight that a lot of people in this space talk about is the notion of intentional targeting. Um, the word intentionally targeting a US person comes from the statute in 1978 from FISA. What does it actually mean? It's not really spelled out and it's very hard to actually know what the intelligence community is interpreting the, this term to mean. Um, what we do know is, um, for the most part, it usually means that they've, not that they've um, stored it in a database or even that they've run algorithms on it, but that they've actually typed like some sort of selector on this, like a name or a topic, and then they retrieve data, like kind of like a search engine, and then it was displayed for a human. So, that would be intentionally targeting. But just collecting the traffic and sticking it in a database somewhere and maybe even running algorithms on it, um, that would be not intentionally targeting. So this is a quote from John Napier Tai, who was um, one of the like, smaller scale um, whistleblowers that came out right around the Snowden period in 2014. Um, he worked at the State Department and he had access to classified data regarding 12333. He came out publicly saying that 12333 was an issue. He has an op-ed in the, in the Washington Post from 2014 you can look at about 12333. And what he says, what does intentional targeting mean? <sighs> hypothetically speaking, under 12333, the NSA could target a single foreigner abroad. And hypothetically, if while targeting that single person, they happen to collect every single Gmail and every single Facebook message on the company servers, not just from that person who is the target, but from everyone, then the NSA could keep it and use the data from those other people. That's called incidental collection. I will not confirm or deny that this is happening, but there's nothing in 12333 to prevent that from happening. Okay, so when you show this quote to people, depending on different people will say, I don't agree with that, that's overly broad. Um, but he was comfortable enough to go out and make this statement, so this is one of the most aggressive statements I've seen about what intentional targeting actually means. We don't know exactly what it means, but it seems like it could be fairly broad. So you can basically take data from a fiber in um, between the Google data centers, take it, store it, dump it somewhere, and you've not really done intentionally targeting until you've searched it or actually analyzed it in some way. Okay, so if you were to conduct surveillance, um, it seems much more convenient to, to tap fibers abroad than to tap fibers in the US because then you don't have to subject your surveillance programs to judicial oversight. You can just run them under 12333, 
which is conducted entirely by the executive branch and not overseen by the judicial branch. Okay, so that's really the issue that I'm trying to make, to bring up in this talk. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a couple of differences between like what might be allowed under um, 1233 and what might not be allowed under 12, uh, what might not be, what, the differences between what might be allowed under FISA and what might be allowed under 1233. So this is an, um, a post from the NSA um, from this April. And um, this was the NSA stating that it would stop conducting about collection um, using data collection collected under FISA section 702. Okay, so without getting into all the details, basically what this means is that they would stop doing collection that was n not to, so let's say the target um, is me. If the email is to me or from me, then you could collect that because I'm the target, but if the email is about me, they used to be able to collect that, but now they're not allowed to anymore. Okay, so about collection, not that they're not allowed to, but they've stopped doing it. So um, in April 2018, they had stated that they were going to stop doing about collection, and with data that they had collected under FISA, okay? Um, and actually, this was an issue people were concerned about, about collection. They were like, okay, to, from, that makes sense for targeting, but about, maybe that doesn't make sense because maybe the target is some well-known figure and I'm just emailing my friends about this news story that was in the news. So why should my emails be surveilled when I'm talking about something that's in the news, right? So, so that's why people were like uncomfortable with about collection. But this is really interesting. This is from an article by Tar Charlie Savage in the, um, in the New York Times. There is no indication that the NSA intended to cease this type of collection abroad where legal limits set by the Constitution and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act largely do not apply. So if you, if you get into this space, you'll start to see like, okay, we're not gonna do this under FISA anymore. But then you don't necessarily see, okay, we're also not gonna do this under 12333. So if you think about it, maybe you can stop doing it on data you've, you've collected within the U.S., but you can still do it with data you've collected outside the U.S. And so that doesn't seem to be really living up to the spirit of people's concerns, right? If people are concerned about about collection, then maybe we shouldn't be doing about collection on any traffic at all, whether it's collected in the U.S. or collected outside the U.S. And there are more examples of, of this type of thing that we can talk about afterwards if you have questions. But this was just like one of the more immediate examples of things that, that were happening, differences between FISA and 12333. Okay, um, so that's, so, so that's, you know, um, I hope you guys get the gist of what I'm trying to say. Like, we, we, we do surveillance reform, we think about FISA and we think about what should be allowed under FISA and what should not be allowed under FISA, but what, these entire conversations are restricted to traffic that's collected in the U.S., okay? And what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make is, like, we should be having this, collect, this, tra this conversation about internet traffic, not internet traffic collected in the U.S., because we know that Americans' traffic does not necessarily stay in the U.S., okay? And the example of that is this, right? My Google data center might be located in Ireland or something, and so why should I have lost all my privacy because Google happens to have a data center in Ireland and most people don't even know that their data center might be in Ireland. Okay, so that's the general point I wanted to make. Um, this, this part is gonna be a little bit more um, this is a legal analysis that I did to try to understand whether it would be possible to use network protocol manipulations to actually circumvent FISA. So let's say we have internet traffic that's in the US and it's staying in the US, right? So it's traffic from my computer to like a data center in San Jose, okay? It should stay, that traffic should only be collected under FISA, so I should feel good because I'm gonna have judicial oversight for surveillance of my traffic. However, what happens if someone decided to actually do a BGP hijack on my traffic and force it to go to Iceland? Um, could, could my traffic then be collected under 12333 where it would no longer be subject to judicial oversight or is that not allowed? Okay, so that's what I wanna work on next. I wanna look at how you can change the routes that traffic take. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about whether doing such a thing on purpose um, would be allowed under the legal framework of US surveillance law as, I can, as we can tell right now. So, um, so, let's, so let's start. Um, okay, so this is, I'm gonna use a hypothetical example. It's a weird kind of hypothetical example. This is something that really happened on the internet. Um, this is a real example of something that happened on the internet. We don't know why this happened. We don't know who was behind it. It could have been an intelligence agency. It could have been a hacker. It could have been a kid. Nobody has any idea who was behind this or why. It could have been a mistake. It probably wasn't a mistake, but 
the people claimed it was a mistake. So we don't know why this happened, but I wanted to look at this particular case because it's really interesting. What happened here is there was a starting point in Denver and an ending point in Denver, and um, internet routing was used to change the route that this traffic took, and you can see this is a very convoluted map. Um, and it just, it left the US, it was two endpoints in the US, and it just went all the way to London, Reykjavik, Canada, and back. And this was done through manipulations of the routing protocol. And so what I want to do is I want to look at the actual technical mechanism that was used to do this routing attack. So we've been talking about laws now. I'm going to dive into BGP routing in a second. Um, we're going to look at how a BGP hijack works. And then we're going to try to understand whether it would be legal to do this on purpose in order to circumvent FISA, to cause your traffic to go abroad. Okay? So the goal would be to launch an attack like this and then maybe pick up the traffic here in London where it could be collected under 12333 rather than FISA. Okay, that's why I'm interested in this question. Okay, so that's what we're going to do next. We're going to switch gears and start talking about um, routing with BGP, internet routing with the border gateway protocol. Okay, so in the example that this is, again, the, 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 the real thing that happened in 2013 here, I'm going to walk through what actually happened in this case. Okay, so we have two computers. Here's one in Denver, and here's the other one in Denver. These two computers are hosted by different networks. This one is hosted on um, CenturyLink. And this one was hosted on Atrato, which is an investment advisor's firm. And there is two routers here. Um, one of them is in Dallas, and the other one is in Dallas. So the way these networks were set up was that they were interconnected through Dallas. So on a normal day, you know, this traffic would have gone from Denver to Dallas and then back to Denver because of how these networks were set up. So over here, we can see the IP address of the destination computer in Denver. And so how does... This router over here learned that this Denver computer is over here. Okay? The way it learns about that is using the border gateway protocol. So what happens is this router here will send a message to the lower router saying, this group of IP addresses belongs to me. So we can see this network here has a network number, 22516. What that uh, routing message, what that BGP message is saying is this block of IP addresses belongs to my network, okay? So we can see here, um, this is a block of IP addresses that have the same uh, prefix. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that this, you see this 19 over here? This means that the first 19 bits of all, of, of all these IP addresses is the same, and the remaining ones are wildcards. Okay, so this is a block of addresses that have the first 19 bits in common. So that's what BGP is saying. This block of IP addresses be belongs to me. This is actually like a little bit strange for me to be going into this level of technical detail, but we actually need to do this in order to do the legal analysis. It's like a weird thing. What's important here in a second is that this is a block of IP addresses, not a specific IP address. Okay, so this block of IP address gets announced in BGP, and then this, um, and then this other router um, we'll say, okay, great, now I want to reach this, this IP address, which is inside this block. I'm going to send my traffic to this router in Dallas. Okay, that's how routing would happen on a normal day. Okay, so now let's see what happened on, um, on, during the hijack in July 2013 that caused the traffic to be redirected. So here I'm, I'm drawing just like some other networks. This is the normal path from this network in Iceland to CenturyLink. Okay, so this is, there's no, nothing weird going on here. This is how traffic would normally flow. But now we're going to see something weird, and here's the weird thing. There was a router over here that was connected to a Trato that decided to tell the internet that it owned this block of IP addresses, and the way and, and the path to reach this block of IP addresses was through 667, which is here, and this one here. So for this block of IP addresses, go through me, and then over here, and the addresses are inside this network. Okay, that's what this message is saying. And so at this point, you'll notice that our, our address over here, our destination, is both inside this block and inside the other block. Okay, let's look at these two address blocks. One of them is a, sla is a slash 19. You can see the 19 here. That means the first 19 bits are common. And one of them is in slash 24. The first 24 bits are common. Okay? And we can see that our address actually falls in both of these address blocks. So which way should this network decide to send its traffic? Okay, that's the question that's faced by a routing protocol. You have an address that falls into both IP address blocks. Where do you send it? There's a, a rule called um, longest prefix match routing. How many people have heard that, longest prefix match routing? 
Okay, so you pick the longest prefix. What's longer, 24 or 19? 24, and so you route this way. Okay, 24 is more specific. More bits are fixed. You're gonna select that path. And so this is what happened to the traffic. Instead of going on the normal route, it went on this route over here, and then for some reason, we don't know why, this router passed it on to some other router and it made it all the way back to Denver. Okay, and this, is, this was what happened to the traffic. It left the US, it went to Iceland uh, via London, and then it came back to the US via Canada. Okay? And all of this was done. What's really fascinating about this is that, at least for me, maybe not for you, is that this was just one routing message in BZ BGP that caused this to happen. Okay? In what country was this routing message sent? Was this sent in the US? No. Okay? So how did I cause routes to change? I just sent one single message from a, a router in Iceland. There was nothing done inside the US to cause this traffic to change paths. I didn't affect any, I didn't take over any routers in the US, I didn't hack into anything in the US. All I did was I had access to a router in Iceland somehow, and I told it to send out one BGP message that caused the paths to change. That's what, that's what happened here, okay? So in the context of our, of our question, which is whether you can use something like this to actually cause traffic to, that stayed in the US before to leave the US, I've just shown you a mechanism that you can do this, um, using a router in Iceland, okay? So not using a device in the US. I wanna point out one more thing. What was the thing that I did here? I announced a block of IP addresses, okay? So did I intentionally target a US person by announcing a block of IP addresses? No, I've announced a big block. It's not a single person. It could be like, I, I'm targeting maybe a single person, one human, as opposed to like this giant block of IP addresses. So my legal argument to tell you that I have not intentionally targeted a US person, one aspect of that argument is gonna be that this message, which came from the router in Iceland, um, was not a single person, it's not a single IP, it's not even a single IP address. If you feel like making the argument that an IP address equals a person, that's fine, but I don't care, because what I'm telling you is this is a block of IP addresses. So I've not targeted a single US person with this. Okay, so I'm gonna, continue down this road of trying to convince you that doing this would be allowed and I haven't broken any of the rules in FISA, okay? I'm going to do this, I'm gonna try to argue that this can be done, cause traffic to go abroad um, without, without violating anything in FISA. Okay, so that was the real incident. I wanna emphasize again, we have no idea who was behind this incident. I'm absolutely not saying that the US intelligence community did this, I have no reason to think that. I'm just showing this example as something that really happened to argue that it could be done, that US person traffic could be routed abroad deliberately, okay? Um, okay, so here's a question. Why did this happen, and what do you need to do such an attack? So just, just a, a note, when you're doing internet routing with BGP, this is not your home router that you have in your bedroom that's also the Wi-Fi access point. These are giant infrastructure routers. Um, so you need to have access to an infrastructure router. Um, and it's really hard to actually just like take an infrastructure router and be like, I'm gonna join the internet and speak BGP. You have to like get into peering points, set up business agreements, it's not that easy. So if you wanted to do this and you were not already the operator of one of these routers, then you could probably hack into an infrastructure router, okay? So another interesting thing that we know about um, uh, surveillance here is that um, the intelligence community has the ability to hack into routers. There's been several articles about this and I think this is really interesting if you, I don't know if anyone can read this. Um, the, this is a clip from uh, some documents that were released as part of the Snowden revelations. So he's, he's saying, happy Friday, my esteemed and valued intelligence community colleagues. There's a huge topic of talk conversation and it's about router hacking. For this point, I'm not talking about your home ADSL router, I'm talking about bigger routers such as Cisco's, Juniper's, Huawei's used by ISPs for their infrastructure. Hacking routers has been good business for us and our five arts partners for some time now, but it's becoming more apparent that other nation states are honing their skills and joining the scene. Okay, so apparently routers are being hacked all over the place. This is, this is um, like a, a statement made by someone in the NSA internally. So we know that the NSA has the ability to do this. The Five Eyes partners, Canada, UK, um, New Zealand, Australia, and the US. Um, but apparently like more countries are doing this. So it wouldn't surprise me if the incident that we just saw was the result of someone hacking into this router, but who knows. So in order to, to, do, this, um, to do this manipulation, you would need to get into the router. So um, now we're going to like, think about this from a legal perspective. 
can we use uh, BGP hijacks to evade court oversight for surveillance? Right? Again, what we need to do this, in order to do this, is we want to use a BGP hijack to cause US traffic to leave the US, and then we can collect it abroad under 12333. So in order to do this, we need access to a foreign router on foreign soil. Okay, so I want to emphasize this router is not in the US, it's abroad. And then we tell the router to do a BGP hijack that reroutes US traffic abroad. Okay, so the question is, if you decided to do this, um, uh, would, you need a court, would you need to go to the courts, to the FISA court, to request permission to, to launch a program like this, where you were doing BGP hijacks in order to reroute traffic? So to answer this question, we have to answer two questions. Um, first, we need to understand, does doing a BGP hijack constitute, um, does it fall under FISA? Okay, so the question of does something fall under FISA uh, reduces to the question of whether it constitutes electronic surveillance. So the word electronic surveillance is a legal term that's defined in FISA. We need to understand if it constitutes electronic surveillance under FISA. That's the first question. And the second question is, would we need a warrant under the Fourth Amendment to do such an operation? Okay, so I'm going to answer each one of these questions. Um, the bottom line is, though, I just want to mention that I'm going to construct a legal argument to try to convince you that you can do this without court oversight. Um, I could be wrong. Um, the fact is we don't know how the intelligence community would actually approach such a subject because a lot of these decisions are classified. Um, but I also want to highlight, and this is really the big issue, is that with FISA, if you have an ambiguity, you have to go to the FISA court, present it to the FISA court, and convince the FISA court that you're correct, that, that you've taken the right decision. With 12333, if you have an ambiguity, then you would resolve that ambiguity internally. You would sort of, the, the lawyers would construct an argument that this is an acceptable thing to do, and then they would never go test it with the FISA court. So this type of argument, if um, internal, if, if executive branch lawyers decided to make this um, argument internally and decided that they were correct, they would not need to go to the FISA court and test it with an external party. They would be doing it within the um, executive branch. Okay, so let's try to construct the argument now. Okay, so does hacking into a foreign router on foreign soil um, constitute electronic surveillance under FISA? So the electronic surveillance under FISA has four clauses. It's defined in four clauses. Um, I'm going to like skip over the reading of all of this thing, but um, what's important in this clause is something falls under FISA if it intentionally targets a US person. Okay, and now I'm gonna argue that what we just showed does not intentionally target a US person because I have a router and it's just broadcasting a big block of IP addresses. I haven't targeted any US person. I don't know what is in that block of IP addresses. Could be some foreigners, could be some Americans, I don't know. So I haven't intentionally targeted anyone and so this clause doesn't apply to me. Okay, so this clause is irrelevant, I'm claiming, and so um, the action of hacking into a foreign router and doing what we just did would not be electronic surveillance under this clause of electronic surveillance definition. Okay, let's do another clause. This one says, the installation or use of an electronic, mechanical, or other surveillance device in the United States for monitoring to acquire information other than from a, a wire or radio communication under circumstance in which a person has a reasonable expectation of privacy and a warrant would be required for law enforcement purposes. So there's um, a couple of words here. First of all, the installation of a surveillance device in the United States. Okay, I've installed my surveillance device in the United States. If I've done that, then it might fall under FISA. Okay. Have I installed a surveillance device in the United States? No, my router is in Iceland. Um, I'm tapping the cable in the UK. So no surveillance device has been installed in the United States. So I argue that this clause is irrelevant to me. I can actually argue that this clause is irrelevant to me in another way, because this clause does not apply to surveillance devices that are wired or radio communication. And so a router is providing wired communication. So doing something with a router or doing something with, a, with an optical fiber, um, that's wire communication, and so this clause also doesn't apply. Okay, so I claim that this does not capture what we just did, not electronic surveillance under FISA. So I feel very confident about these two arguments, by the way. I'm gonna present a in my next argument, which is a little shakier, um, but I, just to show you the like, difficulty in understanding what's really going on in this space, let's look at the next clause. So the acquisition by an electronic, mechanical, or other surveillance device of the contents of any wire communication to or from a person in the US without consent of the party therefore, if such acquisition occurs in the United States, but blah, 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 blah. Okay, so the acquisition, um, if the acquisition occurs in the United States. So what's interesting about this is 
did what we just did cause us to acquire traffic in the United States? If we acquired traffic in the United States, this clause applies. If we did not, this clause does not apply. So here we can start to debate. I'm going to now argue that we did not acquire traffic in the United States. Um, but I, I actually, this is, I think, maybe I'm, where I'm the shakiest. Um, so I'm going to claim that what we did was we sent a routing message here in Iceland, and then we tapped a fiber over here in the UK, outside of the US. Okay, so the acquisition did not occur inside the United States. That's my claim. You might say, well, you know, actually the traffic like moved from over here and then it went here. And so because it came over here, you kind of acquired in the United States. I don't know. The definition of what acquired means is a little bit unclear, right? But I think that I'm not, you know, I'm not stretching too much by saying that we did, we did the acquisition either at the place where we tapped the cable or at the place where we sent the routing message. And so um, the acquisition did not occur inside the US. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's my argument. The, the, the counter argument, I guess, might be is like BGP routing messages could have gone into the United States and the messages that went into the United States are the ones that caused the acquisition. I don't know. But it's very, very tricky, right? Because we're setting up this border of like where acquisition actually occurred. So the bottom line that I have here is we don't really, we don't really know how this would be interpreted. Um, probably not covered by FISA. It might be, but it's very hard to say. It's very unclear. And the reason for this lack of clarity is because this definition that we're being, we've been looking at for the last 10 minutes was written in 1978, right? So nobody thought about BGP routing in 1978 because it was invented like later in the 80s. Okay, so that's my FISA discussion. We have another um, discussion to have, which is whether or not you would require a warrant under the Fourth Amendment to hack into a router and tell it to do a BGP hijack. Okay, so first of all, does hacking into, so right, so, so if we're gonna do a Fourth Amendment analysis, we have to do two things. We have to decide if what we're doing is a search or if what we're doing is a seizure under the Fourth Amendment. If it's neither a search nor a seizure, the Fourth Amendment does not apply. Okay, so when you do a Fourth Amendment analysis, my lawyer friends have taught me that you first look at whether it's a search and then you look at whether it's a seizure and if it's not, then you can sort of say, no, the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply here. So that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna first ask ourselves, does hacking a router constitute a search? Well, this is a really interesting question. Actually, there are research papers being written about this right now. Um, there was a Supreme Court decision in 2012 that, um, that the decision um, was made, the decision that was made was that if you physically trespass onto something, so let's say you go to, actually it's very relevant to the previous talk we saw, if you go to a car and you install like a GPS traffic, tracking device on that car, is that considered a search? Um, and so this decision uh, said that this was a physical trespass and if something is a physical trespass, it requires a warrant. So that's very clear. The question is if you hack into a router, have you trespassed? So for me as a computer scientist, it seems very clear that you have trespassed but you haven't physically trespassed. And so we don't have a decision that says, okay, um, a, 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 a logical trespass or like a virtual trespass, it constitutes a search under the Fourth Amendment. So this is a little bit unclear. And what's really interesting is that there's an article by Jonathan Mayer, who's um, a lawyer, computer scientist, where he looks at um, law enforcement and how, when they decide when they need a warrant. And there's been many decisions where um, it was decided that law enforcement did not need a warrant to hack into a computer if all they took out of the computer was things that's not covered by the Fourth Amendment. Okay, so there are certain types of data that are covered by the Fourth Amendment, certain kinds that are not. So you can hack into a router, take out the data that's not covered by the Fourth Amendment, and that's okay, you don't need a warrant. So that would suggest that hacking into a router, hacking into a computer would not be um, a search, which I think is weird. But anyway, there are decisions like this. And actually, Jonathan Mayer's article is about like, how this is a problematic direction for us to go in. But anyway, unclear at that, for that. Um, now, whether hijacking is actually a seizure is another really interesting question. So there's a legal question about whether if you take data and copy it, does that constitute seizing that data? So certainly, if you take something away, that's a seizure. But if you take data that's already going on a path and you just make a copy and bring it somewhere else, is that considered a seizure? And so Orrin Kerr argues that this is a seizure, but this hasn't really been tested extensively. So there's sort of two reasons to believe here, I have two pluses over here, that either hacking into a router or actually causing it to change directions um, 
causing it, it to change directions would be both a search and a seizure under the Fourth Amendment. Okay, so that looks bad for us because we're wanting to claim that we don't need a warrant. However, I'm going to solve all these problems right now, which is that the Fourth Amendment in general doesn't apply to foreigners located on foreign territory. And this is a decision by the Supreme Court in 1990. Um, and so luckily for us, the router that we hacked into is in Iceland, and it's owned by an Icelandic company. And so one might argue that the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply. There are other exceptions to the Fourth Amendment that we, I don't know as much about, for example, national security exceptions. Maybe there's a national security exception in certain conditions for this to happen. But I think the most compelling thing is the, um, the fact that it's on a, a foreign router and foreign soul. So the bottom line is, you know, again, we don't really know how such a decision would be made. The whole point of this analysis is to say that the way things are structured today, um, the intelligence community can make these decisions internally. They're not going to be subject to public scrutiny. They're not even going to be subject to secret scrutiny by the FISA court if they decide that they don't need to go to the FISA court. Okay, and the whole point of the FISA court is to resolve these types of ambiguities in the law, and this seems problematic. Okay, so that's the point of this article, really to sort of make the point that we, we should really be using the FISA court um, to make decisions like this, especially because we have laws that are very old and technology that's always changing. Okay, a final point before I wrap up. We just went through great pains to think about doing um, traffic shaping by hacking into things and doing manipulations, but um, this is a, a, um, something that was revealed um, in uh, um, an analysis that found that AT&T was cooperating with um, the intelligence community. So here's how they describe Fairview, which was um, revealed to be AT&T. This corporate partner since 1985 has access to international cables, routers, and switches. The partner operates in the US, but has access to information that transit the nation, and through its corporate relationship, provides unique access to other telecoms and ISPs. Aggressively involved in shaping traffic to run signals of interest past our monitors. Okay, so all of the discussions we've been having are whether it's possible to hack into something that's not controlled by you, but actually if you're cooperating potentially with a corporate entity to, to do the rerouting, then all of this legal analysis doesn't apply to you. I, again, I have no reason to believe that this is being done to circumvent FISA, but we do know that um, the intelligence community has these types of relationships with ISPs. Okay, so just to wrap up with the recommendations, um, FISA Amendments Act is up for renewal in 2017. Um, I think this would be a wonderful opportunity to update the definition of electronic surveillance. We spent a bit of time looking at that. It has a lot of caveats and exclusions. I think it would be a lot better to have a definition that just captures more things in particular, doesn't make a distinction between collection abroad and collection in the US. And also the notion of intentionally targeting needs to be clarified. Um, so as a computer scientist, um, you would ask yourself, well, maybe we should just um, you know, make it really hard to reroute traffic. Um, so making unhackable network devices would be pretty challenging. Um, we've been trying to secure BGP for 20 years. We are making progress, but it's hard. Um, and I, in my paper, if you look at the paper, I, I talk about several other different ways that you could actually do the same kind of manipulations using other protocols like OSPF or um, port mirroring and other technologies. So if this means anything to you, you can start to think about doing legal analysis with that type of technology. There is an entire field of network security that's concerned itself with rerouting traffic in different cool ways. And so I don't believe that it's going to be possible to rule out you know, these types of traffic shaping manipulations. So um, this, this also begs the question of whether encryption would solve a lot of these issues, a lot of these privacy issues. And I certainly think that encryption is an important piece. I didn't talk too much about this, but um, there is limits to what we can encrypt. Um, put very simply, encryption c covers, typically covers parts of the message that are legally considered to be content um, and not the parts of the message that are legally considered to be metadata. What's interesting is that metadata is the part that's less protected by the law than content. So encryption and the law are protecting content and encryption and the law are not protecting metadata. And the issue is really, when we think about how much we can do with encryption, the issue is really metadata because the encryption is neither protecting it nor is the law for the most part. And another point, under 12333, when you uh, collect encrypted data, you can store it indefinitely, whereas if it's clear text data, you have limits on the amount of time you can store it. So there, you know, there, encryption is a really important piece, but it's not the entire solution to this. So in my opinion, I think that what needs to happen right now is a look at this definition of electronic surveillance from 1978 and try to see if what the internet is today is allowing this definition to serve the purpose that 
that, that its sort of creators intended, which was to protect Americans from surveillance without court oversight. Okay, so that's it, thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions for Professor Goldberg? Hi, Sharon. Thanks for the talk. Um, I'm curious, from, from lawyers that I talk to, and I'm not a lawyer, but, but from lawyers that I talk to, they, they often talk in, in terms of analogies and, and think in, in that kind of way. And, and thinking about this kind of interception, the analogy that, that kind of comes to mind is, say a police officer wants to search your vehicle but can't because of Fourth Amendment rights and so pushes your vehicle into a jurisdiction in which they can search it, maybe a whole other country or something like that. And I think that, if you think about it in that analogy, it seems like most courts would not ever even go for that sort of thing. So do you know if, if is that the kind of analysis or, or analogy that you think fits in this case, and do you think that, that people didn't raise that or didn't think about that? Or yeah. Okay, so I don't, know, I don't know how to think about analogies and how they would do this. I, I, do, I do know, so I talked about this paper a lot with Tim Edgar, who's a national security lawyer, um, amongst other people, um, amongst other lawyers, but Tim a lot. And, and Tim actually asked me this question. Like, he's like, no way, Sharon, this is against the spirit of the law. Like, this is not gonna be allowed. And so when we talked about that, what, what Tim said was basically, um, if you, if you start to construct a different operational reason for the surveillance, then maybe it's okay. So certainly, like, what seems certain based on the conversation with Tim, I, I'm not certain, but Tim gave me this impression, which was like, if you went and you said, okay, the reason I'm doing this is to circumvent FISA, that would not be okay. But maybe the reason you're doing this is because you've put all your um, energy into building really a great interception technology in the UK for example. And now you want to run all your traffic through these surveillance points in the UK because they have the best storage and the fastest interception and they can collect the most stuff. And like, by the way, it happens to be in the UK and not in the US, right? That's the kind of stuff that I'm worried about. A lot of this stuff can be gamed. And so um, you, want to, you, you would definitely need to, I mean, I think you would need to construct a different operational reason for this surveillance. Um, but I, you know, I could also, my legal analysis could be completely wrong. There could be decisions that are, that are classified that make this wrong. But again, we don't know, right? So, so it sets up this very murky world in which we have this law, but we don't know what it covers, right? So I think it would be much cleaner if, if um, and I'm an idealist, right? It would be much cleaner if this definition from 1978 would be covering collection both in the US and abroad, because you can think of all different ways where you can kind of manipulate this to, do, to avoid judicial oversight. Thanks. I'm not aware that either the Senate or the House Intelligence Committees have had a serious conversation about revising FISA since maybe the Patriot Act. Um, am I missing something? And if you were called to testify, how would you encourage them to structure uh, a meaningful conversation to look at revising FISA along the lines of what you've been talking about? Yeah, I, I think, so there's a lot of aspects of FISA and I have not studied all of them, so I don't wanna claim that this is like the, all the issues. Um, I'm coming at this from the perspective that FISA has some really good parts and that FISA should cover more surveillance. We should not have so many separate authorities. Um, and so really my focus is on the definition of electronic surveillance. This is from the original 1978 statute. It would make sense to go through this statute and just make it a little bit more technology neutral. So like, you know, like there are words in here um, like um, electronic mechanical or other surveillance device or any wire communication, right? So there's a specification of like wire versus radio versus storage versus mechanical versus electronic, which is something written in the 70s. Like I don't even know what mechanical means anymore. Maybe NENs are mechanical, you know? So, so um, taking away a lot of these technological specifications because who knows what type of surveillance is gonna be possible in 10 years. Right, um, so that so that this we would really understand what this covers, and also taking away the um, these distinctions based on where the acquisition is occurring. I can understand distinctions based on who the target is, like in a U.S. person versus a foreign person. Those that makes a little bit more sense to me. But where did you actually tap the cable? That does not make any sense to me as a computer scientist. Right, so that's what I would try to take out of that definition. Thank you. Yeah. 
we were fond of BGP because the first meeting at it was IETF 6, which was held down the street here in Ann Arbor. Uh, and of course, Merit has been trying to, with the Router Arbiter Project, has been trying to prevent BGP hijacking and leaks for a really long time, and Merit's located here in Ann Arbor too. Yeah. Um, but I don't think Cogit is a member of that, and that allows them to be a whole. Um, but, I, but the uh, main thing that I wa wanted to mention was uh, you missed, well, there is also a set of case law, or, or at least things that have been argued um, in briefs, on the meaning of the word acquisition. Mm -hmm. And the NSA's current position is, or seems to be, that ac it has not actually acquired the data mm -hmm. until a human being looks at it. Yeah. So if a, a, a uh, computer at, takes the data and sifts it, it doesn't actually become acquired until a human being looks at what the computer has found, which, again, is not the usual meaning of the word acquired. Yeah, yeah. You know, I bought it at the store, but I haven't opened the package yet. I haven't acquired it yet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's been a lot of discussion about the word acquired and the word collection as well. What does it mean to collect and what does it mean to acquire? It turns out that there are different definitions under different authorities. This is, if I don't know if you can see this, but this is like an old, um, this is actually outdated now, but... Uh, Okay, so this is the definition of collection from an intelligence law handbook, and, and here's what it, like, this, this is something that was like, a, a lot of the internet was fixated on, so if you read the second sentence, to begin this journey, it is necessary to stop first and adjust your vocabulary. The terms and words used in DOD 524, blah, have a very specific meaning, and as often the case that one is led astray by relying on generic or commonly understood definitions of a particular word. For example, collection of information is defined in the dictionary, um, but for the purposes of this, it is collected only when it has been received for use by an employee of a DOD intelligence component in the course of his official's duty and an employee takes some affirmative action that demonstrates an intent to use or retain that information. So it's not only that they've seen it, but they've taken an action with it. Um, this has since been revised, but this is like the type of stuff that you see about the word collection. The word acquired under FISA, this is collection under 12333. The word acquire under FISA, I'm less familiar with exactly how that's defined. Um, but yeah, there, like, there, there's been a lot of sort of interest in like, what do these words actually mean? Yeah. Lawyers will argue about the meaning of the word. Yes. <laughs> you make a strong argument for using the FISA court. Yes. During your research, did you look at the statistics of the number of granted uh, versus denied cases? Yeah, no, a lot of people talk about the, the There's issues. There's 12 of the denied court. cases yeah. since FISA yeah. court was yeah. constructed. So yeah. it seems like a mute point because they seem to well, just approve everything. So, yeah, that's, that's the general sentiment. I, I, I don't think that that sentiment is necessarily, you know. Here's what I will say if you look at, like, like um, this case here. Um, the, the Google Yahoo um, muscular thing, which I showed on this nice slide here. Um, if you read the article in the Washington Post um, that talks about this operation, it explicitly, the last paragraph, um, and this is actually what this whole research started for me when I read this article, is the last paragraph, it, it, it says that this would be illegal if it was conducted in the US under a decision by the FISA court's Judge Bates in 2011. Okay, so like this particular thing would not have been allowed in the U.S. So there are just like so there are things that like that the FISA court does not allow. Um, if you talk to an NSA person, I'm just going to repeat to you what they say to me. Um, they'll say something like, "We don't take um, cases to the FISA court until we're really sure that we're right about them, and that's why we're always, you know." So something that would be more of a stretch, like some of the stuff that I was showing, which is definitely a stretch, probably wouldn't make it to the FISA court because it, you know, they they realize it was a stretch. So. I don't really know how to answer that, but I do think that having a court is better than having no court. So that's kind of that's my basic point. Whether the court is the best court is a different question. Thank you. Yeah. Last question. Thank you for your wonderful speech, but my question involves what about friendly foreign intelligence agencies in the NSA and other uh, services that are trying to obtain information on American citizens. Uh, have you looked into that aspect? Yeah, so the, I think the question is you're saying like, okay, this is very nice, but all of this could be circumvented if I ask like, you know, 
the British to spy on American citizens for me and tell Correct. me the answer. I, I don't know how to properly answer this question, but basically everyone I've talked to who works in this space says that would not be okay. Um, I don't know exactly how to answer it in a more technical way, but if you'll talk to like a, a surveillance lawyer, they'll basically say no, they, they can't really do that. Thank you. Yeah. But I, I don't have like the ability to give like a, a really good answer here, so I just want to make that clear that I'm not the expert on that specific question. Thank you very much. Let's give her one more round of applause.